Now, in continuing our discussion of the muscular system, we're going to look at some organization of the muscular system. The skeletal muscles of the muscular system account for about half of the weight of our bodies. The human body contains about 700 skeletal muscles, and they differ in size, shape, and function. Although the individual skeletal muscle fibers contract the same way, which we discussed in Chapter 10, and to the same degree, basically, the performance of a skeletal muscle varies depending on the way the muscle fibers are organized and how the muscles attach to the skeleton. Now we've already examined how the contraction of a skeletal muscle pulls to shorten. And you have been examining in the lab the axial muscles as well as the appendicular muscles of the body. We've also talked about the attachment of the connective tissues of skeletal muscles which form tendons. All muscles have at least two points of attachment. The origin is the fixed attachment point and the insertion is the movable attachment point. The origin is typically proximal to the insertion when the body is in the anatomical position. Now when complex movements occur, muscles commonly work in groups rather than individually. Their cooperation improves the efficiency of a particular movement. For example, large muscles of the limbs produce flexion or extension over an extended range of motion. The agonist is a muscle that produ produces the major force for producing a specific movement. It is also sometimes referred to as the prime mover. The antagonist is the muscle that opposes or reverses a particular movement, and it opposes the agonist. The synergist is also sometimes known as um, the helper. You can think of it that way. It helps the prime mover by adding a little extra force to the same movement or undesirable or unnecessary movements that might occur as the prime mover contracts. And the fixator immobilizes a bone or a muscle's origin. And you can see an example of prime mover and synergist here with the biceps brachii. Now muscles have their own shape and fiber alignment. And here we can see different shapes and fiber arrangements. Circular, which are also called sphincter muscles, are when the fascicles are arranged in concentric rings. Convergent is when the muscle has a broad origin and the fascicles converge toward a single tendon or insertion. An example would be the pectoralis major. Parallel is when the long axis of the fascicles run parallel to the long axis of the muscle. Pennate is when the fascicles are short and they attach obliquely to a central tendon that runs the length of the muscle. Pennate can be unipennate, where the fascicles insert into only one side of the tendon, 
An example would be the extensor digitorum longus bipennate are when the fascicles insert into the tendon from opposite sides so that the muscle's grain resembles a feather. An example would be the rectus femoris. And multipennate is when the arrangement looks like many feathers situated side by side. An example would be the deltoid. Now, this slide shows how muscles can be named sometimes. Muscles can be named based on their shape, their movement, their fascicle or, um, organization, their action, for example. This just gives you some examples looking at, uh, for example, an abductor. Ab is away from, duck to move, so an abductor is a muscle that moves away from. Or digitus, digit, refers to a finger or toe, and that might refer to a muscle that moves the little finger or toe away. This gives you an idea of how muscles are named from their Latin origins. The other thing we want to talk about is a little bit of muscle mechanics or lever systems. The operation of most skeletal muscles involves the use of a lever system. A lever is a rigid bar, like a board, crowbar, or a bone, that moves on a fixed point. And a fulcrum is when a force is applied to it. The applied force or effort is used to move a resistance or load. Now there's different types of lever systems and in the human body the joints are the fulcrums, your bone acts as levers, and your muscles provide the effort. Levers can operate in one of two ways either via mechanical advantage, and this is where the load is close to the fulcrum, and the effort is applied far from the fulcrum. This situation requires minimal effort to move a large load and is therefore designed for power. A mechanical disadvantage, the load is far from the fulcrum, and the effort is applied near the fulcrum. This situation requires the force to be greater than the load to be moved, but although it can move, cannot move a large load, it can move loads farther and faster, kind of like a speed lever. Now, depending on the relative positions of the three elements, effort, fulcrum, and load, a lever belongs to one of three classes. A first class lever, the fulcrum, lies between the applied force and the load. An example would be scissors. A second class lever, the load lies between the applied force and the fulcrum. An example would be a wheelbarrow or the gastrocnemius muscle. And a third class lever, the most common of levers in the body, the applied force is located between the load and the fulcrum. An example would be tweezers or the biceps brachii. Now, as I mentioned before, muscles can be named for a variety in a variety of ways. By their shape, like the deltoid or trapezius, by their body region, where they're found, brachii, femoris, their size, maximum, minimus, their action, flexor, extensor, the direction of fascicles, rectus, means straight, for example, number of origins, or the location of attachment. 
and you've got two references that show how muscles are named based on the muscle terminology shown here. So um, it shows you their origin, their actions, regions of the body, etc. So you need to know the major, uh, the names of the major muscles, their basic actions function, and their location. So the remaining slides go through the major muscles of the body that you will be identifying on the models or yourself to help you learn them. So these show the overview of the major muscles of the body. And then you've got some slide focusing, for example, on the muscles of the eye, the abdominal muscles, the diaphragm, the intercostal muscles, the muscles of the pelvic floor, the muscles of the perineum, the muscles that position the pectoral girdle, the muscles that move the humerus, the muscles that move the forearm, muscles of the hand, the hip and thigh muscles, muscles of the lower leg, and muscles of the foot. So make sure you can identify those muscles for both your lecture and, more importantly, your lab practical that covers the major muscles of the body.